Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Hackshack Podcast. We've got a very special guest today, Jess Munaymi. I hope I said that correctly That's this okay. time. Thank you very much. I um, kind of butchered it the last time. Uh, Jess, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, it's, uh, I'm honored to have you actually as the first female guest on the show. Um, so I want to start off at your, your last fight. Um, again, another impressive performance. I think you did three minutes, nine seconds, something like that. Um, how did the fight go? Did, did it go the way you thought it was going to go? And, and how did you feel you know, being in there? Yeah, uh, I felt great. Um, it was yeah the most alive that I've, that I've felt in a fight. The most kind of, um, what's the word? Just things just flowed. Like I felt completely free. in, yeah, free in flow. Um, thing, not very little thinking, which was great. Uh, I think a lot of the times in previous fights, I've been very aware of my thought process. Like time slows down, and I can feel myself thinking like this is what's happening. This is what you need to do. Whereas with my last one in particular, it was just kind of it just flowed really well. Um, did it go the way I thought it would go? Yes. Well, it was kind of how Mike saw it going down. With the previous fight, with my debut, um, we thought things were going to go a certain way, and my previous opponent, Crystal, I think she she took my previous fight footage to heart, and they they changed the game plan. So with her, all her previous fights, she came like rushing in, and then made the takedown like very much viable and very mm -hmm. quick and easy. And and with that, with our fight, she tended like she wanted to be on the outside and was a little bit more tentative. Um, with Haiti, we thought that she would rush in. We thought that she would go for like the bully choke type of setup. Um, but at the same time, if they had watched any of my footage, they would have seen that that would not be yeah, a good yeah. idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it went exactly like that. It was probably easier than what I thought. So it was it was exactly how it needed to go down. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, awesome performance. Awesome finish, particularly uh, the mounted triangle with the elbows. Um, can't imagine it's too <laughs> fun to be in that position. It's bad enough without the elbows, but uh, with the elbows running down, it's. Uh, exclamation point yeah um obviously before the fight you know the whole weighing situation happened uh, what exactly happened that led up to that point you know um and and was there sort of like an animosity between you guys up until that point or was it like just out of the blue that that, yeah. that, that had happened it was it's interesting because it was literally zero animosity like we hadn't even made eye contact yet up until that point um but we were following each other on instagram for a while and what i generally do is if i'd happen because i do follow a lot of potential opponents on Instagram um, and generally like a couple of weeks before the fight I start to feel like maybe I'm getting maybe I'm t I've got them too in my head because I'm watching all their stories and let me You're stop about yeah, yeah let me stop worrying about them and, and just unfollow them for a while so I we did that I did that and um, because she's because she's Egyptian we're both Muslim I was like I had a different idea of how it was going to go down I was going to like welcome her to my country and speak mm. to her in Arabic a little bit and like I think I was being particularly friendly, or the plan was to be particularly friendly. Um, and so the weigh-in happened, and the first kind of thing she did is she stepped forward and she put her fist like on my face. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, that's the first time that's someone's put, put their fist on my face. Cool, I'll let that slide. Like, I'm just – and it, you know what? The whole weigh-in thing, I think for guys, it makes a lot more sense. This is very much like I'm going to show my dominance and, like, we're going to both pee on trees kind of mm -hmm. thing. And I think, to be honest, for females, like – I don't know. It's not my vibe. Like I get that it's it's um part it's part of the show and it sells it and it's all really exciting to have like a an intense way in because it you know it hypes the fight and I'm happy to do that. Um, but yeah, it's not really my style to to showboat too much beforehand. I like mm -hmm. to, I prefer to do my talking in the cage mm -hmm. and sometimes afterwards mm -hmm. and then you know and then that's that because the reality is that you can look really dumb mm -hmm. and if you if you act too stupid. But at the same time, there is this this need to um, assert your dominance to a degree, right? It's, a, it's the first time that you're looking inside, probably the first time you're looking into your opponent's eyes. So often you can see a lot um, with, again, my previous opponent, Crystal, like her eyes were shaking at the way. In, and I was like, oh, okay, I see you. So you can, you can read stuff. Um, so I'm looking into Hades' eyes and like she's stone cold, like she's not, there's no nerves. And I'm thinking, cool, this is impressive. You're young. She's like 23 you here for the first time EFC has become my home I'm new to the organization as a fighter but I've been around them for a really long time so I feel really comfortable there so this is all I'm thinking all of this while mm. we're busy staring at each other um and then she steps in and puts her fist on my face and I'm like okay cool so you're gonna touch me fine I'm gonna let that one slide so as Graham is like shake um clapping his hands like okay cool it's done now um she puts her forehead on my head and I'm mm. like 
right? So now I have to assert some dominance back okay. because now... Sorry, I saw your switch. The moment that happened, I could see your facial expression change. Yeah, I was, I was like, like, oh, something's going to happen. I was like, cool, you touch me once, I can let that slide. But like the second point of contact on my body, like now I need to do something back. Mm. Um, and in the moment, I'm like, shit, what do I do? Like, do I do I push? Like, how do I, how do I, because I've never had this before. Mm. And there's a part of me that like, yeah, wants to be that good sportsman type. And the other one is just like, dude, you just you touch me. Anyway, so I push her back a little bit. And she loses her mind. She like shoves me. Not what I expected to happen. Mm. A lot of people said it looked like I tried to kiss her. In hindsight, I think next time maybe I will try and kiss her. I think that's <laughs> really throw the person off completely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I wasn't braced for a push. Um, and then went straight back over the scale. Mm. My um, arch of my foot somehow scraped the the scale and it just flared up like straight away super super swollen and blue um yeah and then mike went off and swore at the coach and whatever and then we left after that so that was that was that um yeah and it i think it threw me off for a moment just because i had expected more sportsmanship Mm -hmm. and that's my own fault Mm -hmm. i think if you always assume that anything can happen then you're ready for it and Mm -hmm. i will be next time um, I've just never had it before in all my fights there's, the vibe's been good. pretty good um, and yeah I've got I've actually got friendship relationships with most of the of, of my previous fights whether regardless of how the result has gone like, mm. we're all good so yeah I think what, what happened after that was just trying to stay composed and not you know let the way in affect how I fight mm-hmm. um, and that was quite difficult because it became the talk and it, it went I don't know about viral but there was certainly a lot of talk around mm. that way and you know um in hindsight it was perfect in hindsight i told the, the p- most perfect story ever because it created the story around like a bully and how the bully needs to get put into her place mm. and all of that stuff and it got a lot of eyes onto onto the fight i think mm. the last time i checked the facebook uh video it's been uh, like 2.2 million views. Jesus, yeah. There. So whereas my previous fight with Crystal's only on like 300,000. That's an impressive. So so that's obviously because of how the fight went down. Mm. But I think the the hype from the weigh-in definitely put more eyes onto it, and the fact that she was an international opponent, so she's got you know her country viewing mm. it as well as as us. But it was interesting to look at the two fights and how the one you know just got so much more legs than the other one because of a little bit of you know yeah, pushing and shoving. Way. Yeah. How badly was your foot injured? Was it a hindrance in the fight at all? Or was it more just kind of you were pissed off about the whole situation? Uh, both. It definitely, I definitely felt it. Um, it was, I felt like, I, like stepping onto my lead leg was a little bit, you know, mm. and just stuff that you don't want to feel before a fight. So um, EFC wasn't exactly like, didn't really care about it. They were like, okay, well, just, you know, strap it up and put some ice and you'll be fine. Mm. And I was like, cool, guys, you guys really care about your athletes, thanks. So no repercussions for them? No, nothing. Uh, and, like, love them. And I get, you know, it's a business at the end of the day. Um, but I did message Graham about it. And he was like, well, I hope you're going to be okay. Just put some ice on her, strap mm. it up. And I was like, cool, I'd like some of her purse. Like, what's yeah, happening? Yeah. And, uh, you know, crickets. I didn't get any response. But it's what EFC needs. They want that. So they want fights hyped. They do offer incentives for, for hyping the fight, like cash bonuses and stuff. And I think Haiti took that to too hot where mm. she was like cool i'm gonna make a statement and, and hype this as much as i can and i think she tried to do that you know at the way in and obviously her walk-in was very dramatic as well with dancing and cartwheels and whatever so she was doing whatever she needed which she, she felt mm. she needed to do um so yeah there was a, a level of hindrance but once you get to that point it's just like well you know if i don't have a foot i'm fighting tomorrow because mm. we're here now but there is the risk of you know there have been fights in the past even at ufc level where people haven't been able to to make their fight because mm. of you know weigh-in um, yeah. shenanigans, and it's it's a fine line between hype and stupidity. Mm. Yeah, look, I mean, one of the biggest fights at the point of all time was the biggest fight of all time. Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz, where Conor McGregor slapped his hand. Where I think it was Nate or Nick Diaz. I can't remember which. The brothers were saying like it's the biggest load of bullshit that he's able to that Conor was able to do that because if Nate breaks his hand, that fight's off. Yeah. You know, and it's, 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 I understand that they're trying to build it and, you know, get eyes on it, which it did do, like you say, yeah. but if you had broken your foot and couldn't fight, the fight's yeah. off. Yeah. So there exactly. goes the money for the organization for that. Um, but, I mean, it is a fine line because it's like, it's a fight, you know, and, and you probably already have so many emotions going through. I mean, I've never, I don't fight, so, like, I, I don't know what, what must be going through your head, but, like, I can, 
some people react differently to it, I'm yeah. sure, and, and maybe that's the way that, that she reacted, but um, yeah, maybe they can just move the scale the next time so that if there's yeah. a push, you know, you're not tripping. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think things like that have happened. There have been shoves and, and, and you know, basically fights that have broken out, but I don't think anybody's, like, fallen over scale before. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely something that um, they need to, yeah, think about going forward. And also something that I'm now kind of ready for oh, the yeah. next time, because, again, I, I guess I just assumed because it hadn't happened previously that as women we operate differently but that's also short-sighted because if you look at previous weigh-ins there have been other fights in the EFC with women where there have been very heated weigh-ins mm. um Amanda Lino there was one with um uh, what's her name now she's in the UFC now um yeah me too yeah, but, yeah um, the straw weights not yes, the yes, flat weights yeah. um she fought in the UFC um mm -hmm. the Sh Cheyenne Cheyenne mm -hmm. Flismas there was a very, very heated fight, uh, weigh in with her as well. It actually went down very similarly to how our weigh in went down. Um, so it's not like it doesn't happen, mm -hmm. but yeah, I guess I wasn't prepared for it. And I think, in terms of how I could have reacted, to be honest, I think I've sat, I've, I kind of sat with it and gone, like, was, should I have not? You know, so you can, you can question yourself, should I have not pushed back? Should I have just stood there? Like, would that have been better? What reaction would have been the better reaction? Mm -hmm. But it, it's just one of those things that in that moment you, yeah, yeah, your body takes over. Yeah. yeah. And um are, are you guys cool afterwards or do you care to be cool? You don't really No, it was that was the interesting the other interesting that came out from the press conference. So obviously my reaction after the fight was <laughs> that was like an out of body experience. It's it's very interesting because everyone was like, Oh, that was insane and I'm like, that was so cool. You should do that after every fight and I'm like, guys, I've never done that in my life before. Like the moment just took me and I think um whatever emotion I needed to suppress to be clear minded in the fight mm. because I don't fight well angry I've had one fight my second amateur fight we had beef and I hated the fight I hated the camp um I didn't enjoy it so after I won I was just like I want to go home mm. you know what I mean you don't want to feel like that afterwards yeah. so I know I realized in that where some fighters need to have they need to hate somebody to fight and they need to have the story and the beef and all of that I actually just fight better when it's not about that and when it's just about my performance mm. um so I think whatever I had to suppress to get through the, the, the fight kind of um, level-headed came out the way it did. Mm. Um, but it feels like that was a different person that was ex crotch chopping and... Where, where did you see that before? Was it, was it from the, the, uh, the um, Contender Series or did so you see I it on think, wrestling? No, so I, probably a bit of both. So like I did grow up with WWE, yeah, but, yes. <laughs> but at the same time, um, yeah, uh, watching um, the recent tough with Juliana Miller who mm. won, and uh, that was obviously what she did after her. So maybe that was in my subconscious somewhere. Um, and interestingly enough, that went around on, on Instagram. So somebody that, so picked up and, and made the two. So we yeah. now follow each other and she's yeah, she's cool. So that's quite cool as well. But it, it was just a, a thing that mm -hmm. happened. Um, after my second amateur fight, when I beat um, the girl that we had um, beef with, I as I stood up, because it was a very, not as beautiful, but second amateur fight, it wasn't beautiful at all. But it was a similar dominant um TKO in the first round and as I kind of stood up I kind of like pretended to kick her okay. so it's interesting to look at those two fights and go like obviously animosity after the fight reaction you yeah. know that that happens without me maybe being conscious about mm -hmm. it yeah so you learn a lot about yourself when you fight like there's it's what I love about fighting is how real and raw the emotion is you can't it's very difficult to pretend to be somebody that you're not in mm -hmm. that moment um so whoever whoever my opponent was or how, whoever she is that comes out so like that's her in her natural like being mm -hmm. and similarly with me whatever came out after the fight was very much just like raw and real emotion um so to answer your question yeah we're not cool um okay. we, we're not she doesn't she's she's behind me like now whatever. yeah she's yeah. behind me now but graham brought it up quite a lot but he was like oh when the guys fight they have beef then after the fight they hug it out and everything's cool but when the ladies fight it's not cool and i'm like mm, it's not that because i'm mates with all my opponents mm -hmm. like that's fine but yeah she her it's what, transpired before. it's what transpired before i can't respect her because of that mm -hmm. I, like she doesn't really um registers anybody in my world right now so i still don't follow her on instagram instagram like she's behind me mm -hmm. um we're not going to be mates and i don't think you have to be mates with no. everybody 
do I hate her? No. Like, do I wish her well? Cool. Maybe we can Just fight again one day. Right yeah. Go yeah. win some fights and come back. Yeah. And, and going forward now, have you got a fight uh, scheduled next? Or are you still looking for one? Because, I mean, okay, two fights in, total takes a long time, what, like under six minutes or something like that? I mean, it's... Yeah. It's, it's yeah. definitely under 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, dominant performances. Is the title shot next, do you think? Um, what do you want next? Yeah, it's been an interesting... It's been an interesting journey. I'm really excited to just be busy. So I'd love to have another fight this year. I'm begging for another fight this year. Um, it seems like it's quite difficult to find an opponent. Mm -hmm. So we were hoping to fight in November. They haven't come back to us with anything concrete yet. Um, they did offer me a very experienced opponent who's a flyweight. Um, and it just, it doesn't make sense to fight upper weight category Mm. with somebody who's had like four times the amount of fights mm. as I've had um, for not a title. Yeah. So she, this particular opponent was somebody that they were like going to build me towards and potentially fight for a title at straw weight next year. And then they've put her forward now, no title, heavier weight division. Mm. I'm like well, what's then, then if I beat her, that, then what? Really? Yeah. yeah. Or if, if I, for, so the, all this, all the odds are stacked against me. Cool. If I do beat her, then who do I fight for the title? Like mm. who's next? So, I think they, yeah, they needed to figure that out. I want to stay active, wherever that is. Um, it's it, it's interesting because I'm older. I feel like I'm fighting this like time battle, mm -hmm. where I feel like maybe I've got two years to you know to do this as much as I can. Um, where a lot of other fighters maybe are happy having two fights in a year, it just doesn't feel like enough for me. So mm -hmm. I really would like to squeeze the juice out of this journey no, as much as sure. I can. Yeah. Um, that was going to be one of my questions a little bit later, is if you would be able to go between the, 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 the weight classes. Um, is it a struggle for you to cut down to, to 115 pounds? Um, or are you quite close? I mean, to, Yeah, so, so I walk around at flyweight. So I'm walking around like 57 if I'm like really enjoying life, 58. Um, so it's not a struggle at all. Um, it's always been the weight that I've, that I've fought at. I think the only time I've struggled to make the weight is at nationals, at amateur level, where you have to weigh in every day on... On the mm. day so you you weigh in on the same day so i made the weight but it wasn't fun um yeah i, I think i'd be comfortable fighting at a catch weight i would consider a flyweight fight if it was for something mm. um like if i don't know ultimate fighter was coming to south africa and they were only casting flight weight flyweights mm. i'd be like cool let's let's do That's it right. because it's tough or yeah. you know if it was a really big opportunity then i would take the risk and hang with the bigger goals but we've got some really good flyweights in the gym um, and I'm not the same size as them. Mm. So I can feel that, you know, you, you know when you just kind of know yeah. that that's not the weight that you're at. Um, so could I, could I do it? Sure. Does it make the most sense for me? Probably not. Um, not just for the sake of fighting, if that mm. makes sense. Yep, 100%. So when did you actually, I think Mike said yesterday, yesterday you, you started training about five or six years ago. What made you switch to, to go from, because I think you did a, a, like a corporate job kind yeah. of before. Yeah. What what made you say I want to go do I want to be a fighter? It's an, it's an interesting one. So I mean, I was doing I've been doing jiu-jitsu for a long time. So on and off ten years, started the jiu -jitsu journey to get back into shape after having a baby, and then started competing. Um, and it was at a time when there just wasn't a lot of competitors, especially not in Cape Town. And having a business, having a family, traveling for you know for, for competition just wasn't really viable. Mm -hmm. So I quickly started running out of goals to compete with and um so it was three and a half four years ago 2019 which is when i decided to have my first mma fight we've been talking about it for a while we were like mm, maybe a boxing fight maybe something and um then i had beef with this girl who owned another audrey we don't have beef anymore audrey mm -hmm. baker she's hilian drotsky's fiance okay. and um we both kind of were female gym owners and we had a little bit of beef and we were like hey friendly beef we were like hey we should do a charity all women's fight event and raise some money for like a gender-based violence um organization anyway that fight didn't materialize in the end as my first fight she pulled out and i ended up fighting somebody else but what it turned into was a, yeah, a charity event it was a woman's only fight night we had a combination of mma muay thai and, and boxing on the fight on the card and as far as i know it's the first of its kind still wow. i'd like to do another one mm -hmm. like a ladies only event I think they tried to do a boxing one recently, yeah. um, but you know that was four years after we did it for the first time. Um, and the bug bit, like after that, I was like, "Fuck, this is this is amazing! Like mm -hmm. I love this a lot." Um, 
I hadn't really done any stand-up up until that point, and I hadn't sparred up until that point. So there was no contact outside of jiu-jitsu oh. until I started training for that MMA fight. And it's ugly. Like, I look back at it now, and it's... The game plan's still kind of the same, is evade punches, take down, finish on the ground. It was also a first-round um, TKO mm -hmm. with a very ugly ground and pound. Wow. Mm -hmm. But it was, yeah, it was an, an, an infectious, awesome experience, and the bug just, just bit, bit from there. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't always that smooth. So my first two fights went exactly like... Um, this last fight went and then I went and lost twice and those losses hurt a lot mm. um, Both times I got submitted. So both times it was kind of losing at my own game. Yeah, yeah, which really sat me and went, oh, maybe this isn't for me um, But yeah, I think win or lose I love What I've discovered is that I love who I am in fight camp. Mm. I love who I am when I'm fighting um, the intense focus that that 12 week if you're lucky 12 week camp demands of you mm. um it doesn't leave much room for for fucking around i don't know yep. if i can swear yep. on this of but like, yeah, <laughs> um yeah and i think so i i can't i'm a recovering drug addict um and yeah it's it's just whether it's the healthy way to look at it or not i think finding a replace a healthy replacement mm. so training's always been there but training with a goal and training with this deadline of like, if, I do, if I'm not 100% perfect with everything, my training, my diet, my strength and conditioning, my mindset, my sleep, I'm going to face another person at the end of this time when this you know, camp expires mm -hmm. um, and she's going to try and kill me. So yeah. I need to be my best. Mm -hmm. um, and that just brings out a, a side of me that I really love. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the reason why it kind of started. Initially it was a bucket list thing, let's do something good for charity. Then it was like, cool, let's just do this because it's fun. And then very much in the same way, we kind of ran out of people to fight at amateur. So I wasn't itching to go pro. Mm -hmm. um, but we got to the end of, you know, who else is there? What else do we do? How many times do we do nationals? Are we going to be content just fighting the same girls over and over? Um, yeah. And then, and and then it was like, then it was just do one pro fight because it'll be fun. Bucket list things. And now mm -hmm. I'm like, I want to go 3-0. I want to, I want to vault. I want whatever I can get out of it. You, you yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not that there's any massive, you know, end goal necessarily, but it's just like, let's see what we can get out of this because mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of fun. I think it's a good place to be because you can focus on the moment, I think, because if a lot of people maybe get wrapped up in what's ahead, you know, like if you've got this many steps, let's say you want to, you want to be the UFC champion one day and there's 10 steps in between. Yeah. If you're, it's good to have a long-term goal, but I think if you're focused, you could sometimes fall off your immediate goals of what need to be, yeah. you know, need to be achieved. So I think it's a good place to be in. And look, I mean, like I say today, you know, watching your performances, they've all been been dominant, and you can just even like seeing the way you train as well through Instagram and everything. Like you're a hundred percent focused, and I think, of course, you're doing what you love as well, which always helps, you know. So. You know, the sky's the limit, I'm sure, um, for you, you know. Yes, but I'm also very realistic about it. So, like, I'm not going to be a UFC champion. Like, it's not going to happen. I'm too old. It's not, I know it's not on the cards. They're not, they're not signing 36, 37-year-olds into mm. the UFC for the first time. So, like, I'm also very, I think, I think a lot of, on the one hand, while some fighters look ahead too far, I think we're also can be too ambitious sometimes. And I think it's good to be realistic about, you know, what's possible. So, EFC is possible, potentially being a, a champion EFC is possible, maybe a couple of fights in an international organization is possible. Am I going to the UFC? No. Like, let's be honest about that. And I'm okay with that. So um, do we have some amazing talent that is 24, 25 year old in this, you know, in this gym that can potentially get there? Absolutely. Am I excited mm. to be in their corner? Yes. So I think so there's something that comes with maturity from a life experience perspective. That's a big advantage. Um, so coming into this, I thought that my age was a disadvantage. And if I was a guy, maybe it would be because I think physiologically there is definitely like a testosterone shift when you get into your later 30s compared to your 20s. Mm -hmm. um, I think women are the opposite. I think there's, there's a maturity, there's a, the a surety of who you are. Um, yeah, I mean, once you've birthed kids, I think you're just ridiculously strong. And I felt that against my last opponent. Like she felt like a pipsqueak mm -hmm. in her... Um, emotional maturity as well as her physicality mm. compared to previous women who I fought have all kind of been around my age. Uh, so that was an interesting realization to have as well. 
What, um, so you said you started out with, with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as, as your base. Um, what was the experience like at the time? You know, were there a lot of other female athletes um, doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Um, and because obviously now there's, there's a lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, you and Monique Fustad and Van Staden were going to be on some, uh, Submission Kings, Submission Queens, um, which I'll get to a little bit later. Cool. Uh, but what was, it, what was it like, you know, when you started out in Jiu Jitsu? What was the scene like um, for female athletes? Yeah, it was quiet. Um, it was very quiet. So I, I think the, the there was a couple of things that happened. So first, this gym in itself wasn't very female friendly and female focused initially. In fact, Mike often speaks about you know he not wanting like women were a bit of a lass. Like having them in the gym was difficult. It added a difficult dynamic, um, and that was when I still had a corporate job. So I had a marketing agency before. I ran that for six years. So I was just kind of coming here twice a week, three times a week to train after work. Um, and at that stage, there was like a handful of women, mm. um, maybe one or two that were willing to kind of hang with the boys. And then for the most part, they, they were kind of just doing striking. For me, I we went through a stage where I wasn't really sure how I felt about rolling with guys. So I would train with Mike. Maybe there was one or two other girls around. And if they didn't come, then I wouldn't train. So it was a very difficult landscape. Mm. Um, and so doing jiu-jitsu competitions, you would go to, and they would – either be you know girls from different um levels that would be bunched together or different weight categories so you're either going to go against somebody way less experienced but way heavier than you mm. or um, way more experienced but it could be anything. whatever like mm. they were just like okay cool you all have vagina so you can all compete against each other kind of thing because they just weren't enough mm. um and that was kind of what the landscape looked like six years ago and then the unfortunate part is that you grade so you get to blue belt level and there's nobody mm. and you look back and there's you know suddenly there's 10 white belts in the category because they and that's amazing because the sport is growing mm. but you're just a step ahead um and that's kind of where we ended up is as i got to the end of my blue belt it was like oh there's nobody left uh, and then we started focusing on mma and i got my purple belt three years ago but i haven't competed yet because i've only been focused competed in jiu-jitsu because mm-hmm. i've only been focusing on mma um, but now it's growing, which is which is great. So I entered AJP for uh, middle of October. Mm-hmm. If I don't have a fight, yes. then I'll do that. Mm-hmm. And it's quite nice to see that there are at least three or four girls in each category, in each weight division. So it's really great to see things grow. Mm-hmm. And it's been a big focus of mine since I've been in the gym uh, full time. So since getting, getting rid of the marketing agency and making peace with the fact that that was no longer serving me, mm-hmm. um, a big focus for me was to change the, the female friendliness of this gym. Um, from the facilities, from a changing room and shower perspective to the classes that we offer, um, to how we engage with women, helping them feel you know, safe and, mm. and, and comfortable in the space to really grow. Because what I've really noticed is that when a woman feels, when a woman comes into this type of environment and they feel completely supported, they, there's a, f- a freedom to grow and really mm. express themselves. And women, in my opinion, and I think Mike's too, actually learn faster than guys do. Yeah. Um, they've got a natural knack for it. So their like days when they first start is much shorter than guys. Mm. But guys mask their inability with a lot of ego and a lot of fake confidence and, yeah. and fluff. Whereas when a woman is not feeling sure of herself, she can quite like cower and, and, and shy away. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to, my real goal in this space is to take all of that away. And the, the, the quicker they feel supported, the quicker they, they, they're learning and just mm-hmm. growing. So we having women come into the space and within four to six months, they're beasts. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the guys sometimes take a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. So it's been really cool to to be part of growing that. Now I've got, I mean, I've got white belt training partners that I can't sleep on. Like they give me a hard time. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas when we first started, I was like, cool, this okay. is how you hip escape, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's that's really cool and, and very rewarding for me to see. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. I mean, um, we were watching ABCC um, and obviously there were, um, so on the first day with the beginners and the intermediates, um, a lot of the most entertaining fights were actually the girls mm-hmm. and the female fights. Um, and I think because, also because if uh, women roll with men, um, you can't rely on strength necessarily. So you've got to start learning your technique, you know, your technique's got to be more on point. Um, and that definitely shows because the technique, I mean, even on submission kings as well, there was a lot of uh, uh, female super fights. And again, were some of the most entertaining fights on the card. Um, the levels really um, gone up. I mean, I, I was watching your competitions years back as well. And like you said, there were 
maybe one or two um, females in there now it's like the female division is or not the same size as the, men, the, the yeah. men's division but it, it's definitely growing yeah um and same thing with the mma um, i think when ronda rousey started with with her whole tear um that really paved the way the, the way for female athletes and i think it's important because um jiu-jitsu not just for competing or just any martial art not just for comp competing but for your own personal safety i think is massive and i think for a lot of a lot of female athletes um, or female um, ladies coming into the gym it can be very daunting the first time because it, it is a male dominated environment still um, so i think it's great to that you guys are, are, are providing this this space um, how do the how do the, the female athletes do you have the female athletes and the, and the male athletes um, rolling together um, is there like a separate class or you know how, how does it work so we have options um, and, I, I, and interestingly enough I, I thought initially that being a female um, owned space that would a lot of a lot of in, like new students will come in here and go I'm a female and I saw that you're female owned or I saw that you got female coaches it's what drew me and attracted me to the gym which is cool so I thought that would be enough and then we started getting requests for ladies only classes so we've added those so we have a 4 p.m. daily slot which is twice a week jits and three times a week um, striking and those are run by myself and Mishka, our other female coach, and it's just ladies in that in that space. Generally, it tends to be more of the beginners. And what I've seen happen is that that environment provides like a very safe um, space for women to kind of get through the teething phase of a new sport. Mm -hmm. And then within three months, you see them kind of filter into the mixed classes in the evenings. Initially, they kind of just stick with another girl in the class and they don't want to roll with anybody else. And then as you see their confidence grow, they start to be comfortable rolling with, you know, whoever. Mm -hmm. So... To answer your question, it's it's a bit of both, and it's really what it, I think we cater for whatever whatever a female is needing in that in that mm -hmm. space. So while I'd like my ladies only classes to be um, to grow into advanced classes and and be quite competitive with the roles, what I've noticed is happening is that yeah, it's got like a three to three to six month window, and then I see the class get small again, and then I have like three or four new girls that come in for the first time, and we're starting from the beginning with like this is how you hip escape, this is how you forward roll, mm -hmm. etc which I'm okay with. I'm okay with the class kind of growing and, and, and shrinking depending on, you know, who feels comfortable to move to kind of the next level, which mm -hmm. is feeling comfortable being in that mixed space. Um, so, yeah, we offer, we offer both. And then from an, that's from a, a commercial training perspective. And from an, a female athlete perspective, I think, again, it's both. So ultimately it's ideal if you can have competitive women to train and spar with because that they're going to give you a real world idea mm -hmm. of how a woman moves their body women train differently we, we we roll differently we spar differently so what you're going to get even sparring with a guy who's the same size as you is very different to yeah he's not going to go balls to the wall full capacity not the guys in our gym anyway mm -hmm. um so it will be technical but you're going to get beat up nine times out of ten you're still going to get beat up and then you're going to feel sorry for yourself mm -hmm. so to to be able to test yourself against another woman who you're both trying to kill each other i mean mike will tell you like the girls in this gym they go harder than any other guys in this mm -hmm. gym like a spar there's no light sparring it's like a fight to the death every time someone's always walking away with blood gashes mm -hmm. something so because you're able to go all out and you're not you know worrying about as a guy being stronger or um need to pull your punches or whatever um so yes, we, it's not that we only train with each other, but it's, we're very blessed that we've now grown. We probably have the largest female fight team in the country. I don't mm -hmm. think that's a, a far, a big statement to make, a far off statement to make. And so, yeah, the more of us there are, the more we're just attracting other women to, mm -hmm. to train at that level with or to grow into a space where everybody's wanting to be competitive with each other. So like tonight, one of Mishka, one of our um, female athletes, I wasn't tra in a session, so she had to work with guys. She would have walked away from that, you know, had a good session, had some good moments, but probably also felt quite frustrated because mm. even if she was working with a guy who was the same weight as her, he still got more muscle mass, he still got higher mm -hmm. testosterone, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it's definitely more competitive when it's a bunch of ladies working together. Mm. And uh, so I want to move on to the, the submission uh, kings or submission queens. Um, the fight with, uh, or the, the match with, with Monique and Stalin, um, why didn't it happen? Oh man, I, it's like it was supposed to happen twice. So I am bummed that it didn't happen. But so we initially confirmed um, about a year ago, and then I got COVID and she broke her toe or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it was off then. And then I 
went pro and started this fight this professional fight career and they reached out and they were like do you guys want to do this and i was like yes absolutely let me have my second my second pro fight and then i'll start training for that and then the idea was to have a fight in november so that i was promised i was going to turn around really fast and the idea was go three and oh this year fight for a title next year mm-hmm. so then we had to turn around and go look i can't i can't in- so that that was a big thing for me was the the risking so watching jelson uh, compete at sub kings um and dominate but he was supposed to fight in october or november um was it october maybe even september but yeah mm. he had to turn around quite quickly and, and fight he had a fight uh, confirmed with johanna from stardom that was now last month mm. and um he buggered up his knee and then had to pull out of that he luckily got uh, paid for mm. um for the winner takes it all so yeah. he walked away with some cash so the fact that he wasn't able to then fight was fine because at least he, he got paid but he still lost lost out mm-hmm. um and so then for me same thing sitting after my fight with with Haney going cool they're not paying me for that for that matchup um so I would do it for free mm-hmm. and potentially risk not being able to turn around and fight from an injury and then not that I fight for the money but obviously it's part of it yeah. yeah so it was just a, a logical decision that I had to make going look jiu-jitsu is always going to be there for me um, it has been there for me as my foundation for the last 10 years. But I feel like I've got such a short window mm. from an MMA perspective. And an MMA-specific camp is so taxing and so specific that it's impossible to train for for both at the same time. Mm. So the decision that I had to take was if there is definitely no fight coming up, um, then I can last minute, like now with, with AJP. I've registered. I haven't paid yet. I've got a little bit of leeway. I can go there's definitely no fight booked and I can make a decision within without being too attached to it, mm. you know, within a couple of days go, okay, cool. Let me go and play there just to stay competitive. If there's no fight coming up, mm. but to, I felt quite guilty to take the spot away from another female who could, who could, who wants that yeah. to potentially drop out last minute or to make Monique train for something. And then doesn't it doesn't happen and they can't find a replacement. So I thought, let me take myself out with ample enough time that mm. somebody else can train and get ready for it. And then when I'm done with fighting completely, then I can go, cool, now it's super match time, you know? Mm. If Sub Kings turned around and said, look, we'll pay you 10K, different story. Then I can mm. say no to the MMA fights, you know? But at the same time, I think if I'm 100% honest, as much as I'd like to do everything, my, my, like my heart is really sitting with MMA right now. Mm. So any jiu-jitsu tournament that I end up doing is going to be a, eh, let's just see what happens. I'm not too attached to it. Mm. And a super fight, you can't enter like that. It's, no. it's different, yeah. you know. It's got a different feel about it. Um, and Monique's tough. I respect her a lot. I think she's she's a really solid competitor. So I would want to give that camp 100%, 100% mm. what it needs, you know. Mm. So hopefully in the future. Yeah, and, and, and maybe it's going to work out well for you because maybe by then, I mean, the, the way Submission Kings is growing, I think it's going to be huge, huge. It's really big, but even bigger yeah. Yeah. in the future. So it might be a blessing in disguise. Um, so you said that the limited time for MMA, how, how long realistically do you, do you think you'll fight and how long do you want to fight for? Have you not put a timeline on it yet? Uh, I, I, <laughs> you don't I, have to I, say I, it, you know, I, I have, um, and I kind of keep changing it. So I'm like, oh, 18 months and then six months go by. I'm like, oh, two years. So <laughs> I think I've got my own stuff to work through in terms of what it means to be an, an older female athlete. I think as women you know, we already have this issue with our age where, you know, you get to a certain age and people feel like they can't ask you how old you are. So I think there's already like outside of MMA, there's already stuff around being older. Um, Then you put yourself in a young person's sport as a female and it it makes it even, you know, more difficult. So the reality is, and and this is something that Mike keeps saying to me, is I I haven't, I'm not Holly Holm, right? She's 38. She's been fighting for like 20 years or whatever. Mm. So she's got high mileage on her. So she's older, but she's older from a damage perspective as well. The body's older. So she's Mm -hmm. 38 going on 50 in terms of her body. Um, I'm actually a baby in the sport. So I've only been doing this for three and a half years. So I'm low mileage in terms of damage. I haven't been knocked out. I haven't had a concussion. I haven't broken anything. So those are the logical conversations I need to have, keep Mm -hmm. having with myself. So whenever I get wrapped up in, you know, the number that it says on the tail of the tape, which is hard to look at. So a big thing for me was I wanted to make my debut before I turned 36 mm. because I didn't want the tail of the tape to say 36. And then they ended up um, taking the year that you Born. turning, the year that you're turning. Mm. So I ended up being 36 anyway, uh, even though I hadn't officially turned 36 yet. I was like, well, that's there now. Um, so it's my own hangups around my age that actually 
don't necessarily have a an effect on the way you fight. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So the 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 short story is there isn't really a time frame on this. Um, let's see where it goes. But the the reality is that I don't. Besides EFC, I don't know if there's necessarily an international organization that's going to want to sign a 37, 38, 39 year old. Like mm-hmm. if we're honest, you know, you don't really see a lot of 40 40 year old females fighting. Um, well, look, sorry, you never know. I mean, look at, look at uh, I think they signed, okay, Yoel Romero was an Olympic wrestler and everything, but I mean, if, if you're doing well enough um, and you've got a big enough name and following and you're actually putting, still putting people away, I mean, I think they signed Yoel Romero at 39 yeah. or 40, it yeah. might be. So you never know. I mean, it's an open book. It could, yeah, it could still happen, but it, it seems like you're taking it step by step, which is good. So, again, focusing on the next task at hand rather than just being all over the place or focusing further ahead yeah i think that's it it, for me that's important is um reminding myself why i'm doing this Mm -hmm. um i enjoy this the 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 self-discovery of the the initial process that that the time limit of okay cool over the next 12 weeks i learned so much i walk away from every fight going like wow like i learned so much about myself Mm -hmm. and i feel like i peel away layers not just from a skill set perspective, but from an emotional and mental perspective about who I am. So I'm enjoying that journey mm-hmm. a lot. Um, and MMA is really just the vessel to to uncover all of that with. What's been the biggest uh, thing you've learned to date about yourself? Well, that's from MMA, yeah, you know. That's a hard question. Um, or what's what? Where, where have you been the proudest, maybe growth-wise, um, you know, through doing MMA? I think in terms of in terms of discipline has been a big thing for me. So coming from a quite a, and feeling like I came from quite an ill-disciplined uh, space, being a drug addict, um, having some, like, I think failed business ventures and not always being very meticulous with um, systems, actually, in general. So it's something that, like, Mike will rag me about a lot is that because he's quite OCD and I'm the opposite of that. So, like, I don't close lids and I don't close cupboards and I'm, like, mm. stuff lying around everywhere. Um, but he's like, you're fucking OCD with training. So it's been this, the motivation to, the motivation of somebody trying to kill you is can turn somebody who's quite a, a free spirit into mm. quite an OCD personality very quickly. Mm. Um, and so that's been quite good for me to, to come to the realization that I actually do have discipline and when I commit myself to something there there is a lot that I can actually achieve because mm-hmm. growing up I wasn't a natural athlete um, I didn't play sport in school I did drugs um, I was very good at, at that I was winning at that. Asking what, what, what drugs they were, or... yeah I mean sure I was 11 years old when I started smoking weed for the first time wow. and by 13 I was taking ecstasy and by 16 I was doing cocaine and took so i got clean when i was um 21 mm-hmm. and then stayed clean for a while and then relapsed about six or seven years ago briefly and then i've been clean for about five years now and um yeah so in terms of winning at something i was really good at taking drugs that was a sport that i was good at but mm-hmm. i never really played any other sports and um i wasn't very academic either so i didn't grow up with a culture of excellence in any way um so stepping into the space late in life with where i could feel like i'm actually good at something Mm. um and not naturally i wouldn't consider myself naturally good at fighting it's something that i have to really i I often feel like i have to work harder than anybody else in the room you know that's the saying of like you need to be the hardest worker in the room room, yeah yeah. but like i really feel like if i'm not then i'm not good enough Mm. um so that's really the, the like the learning or the lesson that I get out for myself is that, you know, whatever stuff that you maybe you were in your past, that doesn't have to follow you if you mm. put the if you put the work and the commitment in. Mm. No, definitely. Well, that's um, I mean, I'm I'm happy that that you were able to to overcome it um, and you know have something to really put the focus into now um, and like you said earlier, channel that energy into into this. Um, and, and I think a lot of times, you know, especially in our young years, we all have young years, I'm, I'm not old, but yeah, I'm getting there. Um, but uh, I think it's also, like you say, you know, you've got to have something to channel into. And I think, you know, um, especially like, it sounds like you like me, like you're hard on yourself a lot, mm. a lot of the time. So um, if something doesn't go the way you planned it to go, 
you know, it is very easy to feel like you've failed at it and failed at life, um, you know, in that time. But um, once you find what you truly love, I think that's what, what you've done. Um, you can put all your energy, put in 100%, and now you find out that you are able to do this. Um, and and it, is, it is something maybe you thought you couldn't do before. Um, going forward now, what kind of things are you putting in place just to make sure that you are... Uh, preventing injury or you know training optimally um, you know I know um, like your diet obviously has to be on point and your training and that kind of thing um, is there anything different to like a normal training schedule that, that you've like, implemented lately um, to just sort of stop injury uh, prolong your career and, and stop injuries sure stopping injuries that's an interesting one I haven't really thought necessarily about that um, we've been quite lucky with not having too many injuries up until this point so I think just generally training as smart as as possible but mm. i do i say that and the reality is that i tend to overtrain i think we all do but mm. um for me uh, it really it's it's starts and stops with diet primarily so i find that when my diet's on point everything else falls into place mm. so sleep is better training is optimized um your recovery is optimized so your everything else is Prevented, is prevented kind of through diet. It's, yeah. it's, it's how my what my experience has been. So, um, I three I think three or four years ago I did a um, certification in primal health coaching. It was during COVID. It was twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. Uh, spent lockdown getting certified as a primal health coach, and that was a really profound um, course for me because I learned a lot about you know just why why eating things that are grown in the ground. <laughs> or were actually alive, um, can really be a game changer for your health. And since then, um, I've gotten kind of deeper and deeper into it. And I would call myself animal, have a, following an animal-based mm, diet or carnival. Yeah. Um, so really prioritizing um, animal protein and some fruit as carbs. And that's been a real game changer for me um, from a mental clarity perspective, from a recovery perspective. I try not to be too preachy and like mm-hmm. culty about it. Um, I'm not definitely not liver king. Um, and yeah, I don't think that we need to necessarily eat liver raw to get the benefits of it. So I'm not guzzling down these chunks of, mm. you know, of raw, raw meat on Instagram. Um, but when I'm, I think a lot of fighters tend to be, and why they relate to like a patty pumlet, for example, is because a lot of fighters are like that. So we go through these, phases of severe calorie restriction um, and restriction of all the nice foods that we mm-hmm. want to eat and then like we all or nothing approach. yeah and then we binge like animals Which afterwards all or nothing on the opposite side. exactly and you know a lot of the time you're saying to yourself well as long as i can make weight as long as i can get my weight under control none of the you know nothing else matters but the damage that you're doing to your body because these guys aren't necessarily stopping training mm-hmm. they're just training on terrible fuel tanks so you're training on alcohol on processed carbohydrates and sugar um, and you, the body can't function and repair itself and, and um, you know come back from that as as well so what you're getting from your training at that point and the pressure and the stress that you're putting your body under trying to operate at that level with all that inflammation mm-hmm. is is detrimental so I think look I'm not perfect but for the most part when I'm when I'm being good and I'm optimizing my diet in a way that serves my body the injuries aren't you know are non-existent but on the days where i have binged and i have gotten and eaten pizza or sugar and stuff you can feel the inflammation in your body straight away mm. I, like i've become so in tune with it so that for me is my kind of secret weapon and my game changer is um yeah a primal diet an animal-based diet so what what exactly so i know you said you got fruits as well but like I, you know when i hear animal-based diet or what i've seen or like carnival diet and stuff it, it's just red, uh, just meat yeah. in general. So is it is it red meat, or what, what type of meat is it, and what can you add to it? Cool. So initially, when I kind of started on this journey, I would say I was a little bit more keto focused, low carb focused. So kind of still eating lower fat um, meats, you know, quite a lot of fish and chicken, and then getting into the kind of sh- keto treat space. Mm. So eating a lot of like carb free desserts and things like that, which is all processed crap, mm. if we're honest. Um, and then as I kind of moved more into understanding what, what carnival was, initially carnival was just about eating meat. So 
you're still going to operate in that low carb keto space because you're not taking any mm-hmm. in any carbohydrates. And as I started following um, Carnivore MD a little bit and, and how he speaks about, you know, his initial carnivore journey was to combat um, autoimmune diseases. So when you go completely carnivore and you're only eating red meat, uh, so he would eat uh, predominantly beef, grass-fed, organic, free-range um, beef, and then maybe a little bit of um, game and, and things like that. The reason they tend to stay away from things like fish is mm-hmm. because of how polluted the ocean is, yeah. so the high mercury yeah. levels. And the reason you would stay away from chicken is because most chicken, it's very difficult unless you've got chickens on your own farm to find grain-free uh, chicken. Most yeah. most chickens are, are fed grains and are kept Absolutely. in some yeah and, and and kept in some kind of cage, so they're not mm. free to roam and eat worms and whatever. Um, so generally, it's beef and eggs, like your, your predominant uh, focus. So if you're just eating that, you're not getting any, any carbohydrates, which is great if you are if you have autoimmune disease or if you're sedentary and you don't need carbs to, or if you're obese. Mm. But if you're an athlete and you're training, you need carbs. Yeah. So. I went through a couple of my amateur fights trying to be keto and running on no carbs. And I thought I felt fine. But if I look back at my weigh-in pictures now, I definitely don't look as, as, as strong and as good as I, as I feel mm. now. At the time, I felt like I was surviving quite, you know, quite well in, in my sessions. Um, but now I just feel like I'm on a different level completely. Mm. So following him in particular and how he's added fruit as carbohydrates. So the theory is that fruit growing on trees, being colorful, um, having you know seeds that need to be spread, the fruit kind of wants you to eat it, so mm-hmm. it makes it easy, ex- easily accessible. It's sweet, it's tasty. So the theory is that your veggies, especially your like cruciferous veggies like broccoli and spinach, things that grow in the ground, they've got a lot of um, chemicals that they emit to stop animals from eating them. They don't actually want to be eaten. So you can actually get quite. You might not realize it, but you can get quite sick eating. So a lot of a lot of people will complain about a lot of gas if they eat mm. broccoli, for example. The reality is that we live with this kind of baseline of aggravation in our bodies often, and we don't really know that it's because of the food we're eating. We just think it's normal to be farty or to mm. go through periods of constipation and diarrhea or whatever the case is. And so through studying this, I'm realizing that actually those things aren't normal. That's your body going, I don't like eating broccoli or mm. I don't like eating spinach. So right now my diet is after playing with it and seeing like what, so as you start to take things out, you start to realize really what's aggravating you. Mm. And it might be slightly different for you as it is, as it is for me. But what really works for me is animal, animal protein. We do a little bit of chicken, but I kind of keep chicken more for when I'm cutting weight. Mm -hmm. Um, So if I'm not cutting weight, then it's predominantly beef, some lamb, um, lots of eggs and lots of fruit for for carbs. Um, I, Barely eat veggies. Uh, I might do a little bit of spinach here and there if it's like in a soup or a broth or something. But I think the fighter diet of uh, chicken and broccoli yeah. is something I'm very, very happy to see the back of, to yeah. be honest. And fiber? What, what, so are you getting enough fiber from the fruits? Or? So you get plenty of fiber from the fruits, um, but you'd be surprised the theory that we have around how much fiber we actually need. Like things move very, very. So. There's a lot less waste mm-hmm. when your body wants everything that you're eating. Okay. And you'll notice this, especially like vegans. We'll talk about like how often they go to the toilet and like, like how much they need to eat and how much needs to come out. It's, I can't believe this is where we, what we're talking about in this podcast. But yeah, when, you're, when, when your body's taking in everything that you're, that you're putting in your body, there's actually not much that much that needs to come out and it comes out quite easily. So mm-hmm. you don't need a lot less fiber to move things along. Um, but fruit also has been a fiber in it. And uh, okay, last thing about this because it's like all the <laughs> way with um, protein. Protein wise, um, are you doing like two two, uh, two grams per pound or? Yeah, what, so I do about two k two k two grams per kg. Okay. So probably a little bit more because I don't actually weigh sixty kgs. But in my mind, I round myself off to sixty kilograms, and I aim for minimum one hundred twenty mm-hmm. grams per day. Um, but I, I actually walk around at 58 kg, so I'm doing quite a, quite a lot more protein than, than that. Um, and it's really easy to get that amount of protein. Yeah. So when cause I have a couple of health coaching clients, and often the feedback I get is like, oh, I struggle to eat so much protein, like, can I have a protein shake? And my answer is cool, like, if that's what you want, because it's easy to put together, um, or because it's an affordability issue, then by all means. But you can't think that just the because, places, yeah, that just because the macros are there, that it's going to be as good for you as eating a steak. Mm. Um, I'm actually 
yeah, my I'm gonna make t-shirts one day that say just eat a steak because to be honest, so much of our health problems can be solved by just sitting down and eating a good steak. Mm. Yeah, I've seen that quote before on your, I think, on your Instagram. <laughs> That'd be a good T-shirt to make. Yeah. Do the vegans will love you. Yeah, you might get some activists outside here. Um, one of the things I've seen you've been quite vocal about is the the whole story at the at the CrossFit gym. Um, I don't know 100 percent what happened. Um, do you? Yeah. What what exactly happened there? Um, do, do you know the people? Or, yeah. I mean, so so no. Um, not and sorry, and, and I know why it would would, would annoy you so much because you guys are trying to create such a safe space. Yeah. Here, um, and that seems to be the complete opposite. Yeah, it was a. It, it was so interesting how the whole thing went down. So we had the article shared on one of our uh, WhatsApp groups here. I had no idea who it was, but I initially saw it straight away because it was shared on one of our WhatsApp groups. I thought maybe it's an MMA gym. Um, and then one of our members who does CrossFit was like, no, it's it's this particular CrossFit. And I was like, okay, cool, that's interesting. I'm going to leave it at that. Then I realized that I actually knew somebody who coached at that particular CrossFit. So I thought, let me reach out to her. What if she was the victim? So I sent her a message going like, hey, one of our members sent us this. I heard it was this CrossFit. Um, are you okay? I know you, you train and teach there. And her response straight away was... Um, I only know what's been on our WhatsApp groups, and um, I know the I know the, the, the person in question really well. Uh, I don't want to get involved. And I was like, look, I wasn't messaging you to get the scoop. I'm not interested in the scanner. I actually just want to know if you were okay. Like, mm-hmm. were you the person that was filmed? So the story is that a cell phone uh, that this guy uh, put his cell phone inside the ladies' bathrooms and was filming a member who I've since found out is only 19 uh, showering. And um, she then saw the phone and thought it belonged to somebody and then saw that it was filming and that's how the whole thing came out. And didn't feel like the issue was was dealt with um, well enough. And that's why she went to the media about it. Um, the whole community was quite interesting in terms of how closed it was and how they kind of wanted to sweep it under the rug and not talk about it. So that was the first response I got was, um, I know the guy really well, he's a friend of mine, I don't want to get involved. Um, and when I said to her, look, I wasn't trying to get the scoop. I just wanted to know if you were okay. Her response was, look, sadly, it's true, but he's been a long-term, a long-time mentor of mine and, like, I don't want to talk about it. Okay, cool. No problem. I then went and made a story post about the issue. Mm-hmm. More coming from a place of, we've had, because I had a similar experience myself, because something very similar happened in this gym before I was here full-time, um, and because it wasn't dealt with properly here, that person who did it here, there were signs. That individual spoke about women in a certain way, behaved around women in a certain way. They had extracurricular activities that were unsavory. So when it happened to me, I kind of felt like unsupported because the, the signs were kind of there already. So my, my post on Instagram initially, which was one of my stories, was... A little bit blamey without me trying to be blamey saying like how did his circle not see this type of behavior coming you don't just wake up one day and film somebody mm-hmm. in the shower there are other kind of i feel like there's a bro culture that protects um behavior whether it's cat calling how you speak about women in your gym uh, whatever the case mm-hmm. is and people got really upset about that probably because it seemed like i was accusing them of of being responsible mm-hmm. so that was maybe wrong but so what came back was like a lot of a lot of anger from the CrossFit community in particular. Really? Um, was that was that pri- like private messages? Yeah, lots or, of DMs oh, okay. basically saying like this is a matter between us. You should keep you know this doesn't concern you. Uh, you ruining this guy's reputation by talking about this. And then the other one was you know if this was your husband like you know you wouldn't want this all over social media, would you? And my response that that's when I was like okay cool we need to make a timeline video now that's not going to expire in twenty four hours because. Um, that's the other thing about getting older is you start giving a lot less fucks about what, mm. what people think, you know? So I was like, cool, we'll do another video so that you guys hate this so much. And so on, in that video, it was important for me to say, look, if this was my husband, actually, I would have said something on social media. I wouldn't have, you know, tried to sweep yeah, it under the rug and, and, and be quiet about it. Um, and yeah, then in that same time, what really kind of pushed me over the edge was um, Rachel Khaleesi did a very similar Instagram story that was the opposite of what I was doing. So she happened to train at this gym and her Instagram story was, so guys, I want to get fit for summer and I need some friends to train with. So I've opened up my slot at 8.30 in the morning for all my fans to come and train with me. 
So DM me if you want to come train with me. And oh, by the way, I train at this gym. So I messaged her. I'm like, are you serious? You are like the wife of the Springbok captain. You've got 300,000 followers on Instagram. And you are actually out there promoting a gym that's now in the media for not being a safe place for women to to train in. Like, Mm. what are you doing? And her response was, I'm worried about the people who are going to lose their jobs in that gym because of what's happening. And that's why I'm just trying to help. When I challenged her on that, she just kind of stopped replying to me. So it was all of that that kind of sparked this need to to put a video out. Mm. Um, and I'm not, I haven't really used my platform for something like that in a very long time, but it was a matter very close to my heart for two reasons. The one, being a victim of something quite similar um, and it not being dealt with properly. And two, because we're trying to create that safe space, mm. I feel like in a sense I have to advocate for that stuff. Um because somebody needed to say something. Mm. And all that was being said at the time was by guys. So there was um, another gym, Fitness Mafia. Um, his name's Mark Anthony. He did a whole post. He happened to be friends with the owner of that gym. So he did a whole thing. And then he ended up doing a whole bunch of pieces of content about like how you correctly spot a woman without touching her. Like trying to, you know, like um, sex educate yeah. or not sex educate, but like educate um, other male personal trainers on how to be with, you know, how to interact with women, which is great. That was for him to do. It wasn't wrong. But I felt like we needed to say something, Seriously. yeah, which is which is what we did. And then a lot of a lot of people, uh, I don't know if you what the NGL stands for on Instagram, um, but where you can do things anonymously. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of guys that you came came forward and said, you know, I think you put a, you put something up about um, a time where, and I think at the yeah. beginning uh, a lot of ladies uh, misunderstood it, but it still put awareness on it. But yeah. it was to sort of say, you know, was there a time where you might have done something inappropriate, yeah. no judgment. Um, and, and completely anonymously and, and quite a lot of people actually came forward with that. yeah i think i would have liked to have seen more but uh, it was a big ask so the the question exactly was that was you know we we've held so on another occasion when there was a big gender-based violence focus um nationally we actually held a little uh, talk with our male members where we we had we spoke about gender-based violence and times you know what cons- what consent actually means and times when maybe as a guy you have overstep that cons- you know consensual mm. boundary without realizing it so maybe pressured a girlfriend when she didn't want to have sex or whatever the case is so we, we've we've held these types of discussions because it's been something that's been very close to my heart for a long time so with that in mind the, the post on instagram was about um yeah was there a time when you've maybe um overstepped a boundary and not realized at the time that you'd overstepped a boundary and then later kind of come to a realization and um yeah i got a lot of trauma instead mm. it was just a lot of women complaining about times when they were sexually harassed and raped and i was like wow i was silly for thinking it was going to go any other way because mm. that just sums up the problem in our country right yep. um but yeah what so even though 80 percent was that it was really refreshing to get a couple of comments and even from one female so i got a comment from one female saying um there was a time when she feels that she pressured so she she, yeah, she pressured a boyfriend or something no 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 she, she hired a, a personal trainer who she had a crush on and through paying oh, him yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Through, through paying him she, she felt like she pressured him. him because he didn't want to lose the business yes. so he ended up hooking up with her mm. which was quite interesting for me um to to read that but yeah so there were a couple of gems that came through with guys that had realized things and there was um, the one guy that trains here Ty- uh, tyler who is in the tattoo space who spoke about the tattoo industry mm-hmm. being quite toxic so i hope that through that i was able to just use the platform that i have for a little bit of um retrospection mm, and to, st- to start a conversation so actually i come from a journalism background um i worked as a radio journalist for a very long time so i i used to do a lot of talk radio debates and and have people you know thrash out ideas so i'm used to people shouting at me for stuff mm. um and then i moved into the marketing space and now i'm here so every now and again it's nice to kind of dip my toe back into yeah into that space yeah, yeah into that well, I mean, I commend you for doing that because, um, you you know, a lot of people want to shy away from that kind of thing, especially with a big following like, like you've got. Um, and, uh, you know, you didn't shy away from it and, and, and brought a lot of awareness to it. And, and I mean, people who who aren't even in the, in the jiu-jitsu space or uh, uh, in the MMA space, we're talking about it. I mean, we've got friends that actually ask me, like, do you know G.I.J.S.? I'm like, yeah, I know G.I.J.S. <laughs> oh, well, I, know, I don't know her, but I know of her. And did you see her post? And I'm like, oh yeah, did you see the post? So it did have a very, a very wide reach, definitely. Yeah. I, th- I think it's quite scary because the video was quite ugly. Like it was a very emotional, like, let me just go into the back room and quickly film something. And um, yeah, there was like, I wasn't 
his clothing wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing that day. Mm-hmm. So it was an interesting lesson for me as well that, you know, you need to think about how you put things out because you don't know how which video that you put out is actually going to get the traction, oh, well, right? Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't the prettiest video, but it's fine. It served its purpose. Yeah, yeah no, definitely, definitely did. Like I said, a lot of people talking about it that I, I don't think would, would, would know, you know, being outside the space. Um, I think I always ask this question um, at the at the end of the show. Um, any any final words or any any words of wisdom for everybody listening at home? Look, I think I'm not sure. You know who's going to end up listening to this, but for me, a big a big message, or if I'm going to leave any kind of legacy behind when I'm done with fighting, um, I really want people to believe that they can do whatever it is that they set their mind and their heart on doing. So. It's never this idea of like it's being too late um, or you being too old. I think that's something that I've been grappling with over the last year or so. And any time that you really set your heart to doing something and, and the fact that you can change your mind. So you can be, you can own a marketing agency one year and then, you know, two, three years down the line, you can be a professional fighter. Like mm-hmm. those, are, those are two completely different things. And if I can do it, anybody can. I think a lot of the time... Um, we make a lot of excuses for why our health isn't as optimal as it can be or um, why they can't, why we can't achieve our goals, whether it's to be a pro fighter or to run a marathon or whatever it is. Um, we tend to put a lot of like bullshit in the way mm. because it's, it's actually quite scary to go out and achieve that thing. But literally there is no, there's no excuse. There's no amount of children or amount of hours spent in a business or for a boss that can actually viably take you away from doing the thing that you want to do if you really want to do something it can be done mm-hmm. um so if i'm ever going to leave any kind of story behind or legacy behind I, like i really hope that it would be like wow she really she went out and did all of that and if she can do it so can i well so far that has been the story and, and i look forward to what is going to happen in the next next couple of years uh, I look forward to you also becoming an EFC champion, hopefully a double champion. Um, and yeah, I hope we can do this again sometime in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, that was a lot of fun. It. Thank you. Thank you.